The Era of Good Feelings Lecture Part 1 The years 1815 to 1824 Kind of in the post War era after the War of 1812s So what did we see? What's this condition of the nation? Well first of all there was a rising spirit of nationalism What were we fighting for? As a result of this nationalism we saw an expansion of the economy and the growth of manufacturing uh, particularly in the textile industries and in the merchant areas in the Pacific or I'm sorry in the Atlantic Northeast you also have the growth of white settlements as whites are moving further and further west into the frontier and the creation of new states as those people move into the frontier they want to enjoy the rights of citizenship and statehood the war also exposed, though, grossly inadequate transportation and financial systems for this newly industrialized age. So along comes a man by the name of Henry Clay, and he proposes what is known as the economic nationalism, and he calls it the American system. And it's sort of a three-pronged approach. One, it includes the tariff of 1816 which was to promote and protect American industry. Second, he said we should have a second bank of the U.S. The first bank charter lapsed, and he thought that we needed to reinstate that bank to sort of bolster the U.S. economy. And finally, he called for international improvements of those transportation systems that included federal subsidies for roads and canals to be able to allow farmers to bring their goods to market at a reasonable expense in time. He was also known as the Great Compromiser, Henry Clay. So he's part of this new generation of politicians that's rising up um, in America and his American system uh, did get and was successful in the West. It got roads and canals built through the use of federal aid to the, the North, East, and into the West. He did manage to get tariffs um, passed, which supported the East, but people in the West felt that they were not helpful to them. And in the South, they didn't really receive or reap any of the benefits of the American system. So it's questionable as to whether it was actually successful. And you start to see that sectionalism really begins to develop this division between the North and the South um, with even the economics and the economic system at this time. So there were some infrastructure improvements and you can see in this map that most of it was concentrated up here in the Northeast. The South really is lagging behind as is parts of the West but mind you, this is still frontier land in the early 1800s. We do have our first national road that is built at this time. It's called the Cumberland Road, and it extends from the Chesapeake in Baltimore and goes all the way across the great state of Ohio to St. Louis, where people could bring their goods up the Mississippi or down the Mississippi, up the Missouri and the Ohio rivers to get them to these roads. So here you can see sort of the picturesque industrial town of the early 1800s. But the United States had some pretty serious financial issues as a result of the war. Uh, the federal government had needed to borrow money. And without a national bank, it had to borrow that money from the states. It couldn't issue its own bonds or currency. Uh, and so then they needed to pay these debts back at random higher interest rates. Not all the states were doing the same thing. So there were some serious problems that they had to solve. So what comes as a result of this governmental fiscal crisis at the end of War of 1812 is the National Bank is rechartered. Republicans back it, seeing that it's necessary. Calhoun, Clay, and Daniel Webster support that national bank. These are some of the new generations of politicians in the early 1800s. And so the second bank is chartered in 1816. The federal government tightens its grip on the regulation of the monetary policy through the use of that bank, which is something that we take for granted. We just assume the Fed is going to control the supply of money, but it was new and, and revolutionary at this time. So what happened after the bank was rechartered? Oh no! 
bad economy. There's actually a panic with rampant unemployment. And here you can see a cartoon from the time where people are really upset about the state of the economy. So the second national bank, uh, Republicans generally opposed the bank. They thought it was a Federalist idea. Uh, the first national bank lapsed and was not rechartered and nothing uh, was offered in its place for quite a while. Um, so again, they had to rely on state banks. So again, states doing their own thing, this caused a problem. And as a result, we get the Panic of 1819. Literally, people are running to get money. And panic sets in as a result of the fact that we were without a bank for five years. Loans were called in. Lending policies were tightened. And it was very difficult to get credit to purchase anything. Um, there was no federal currency to stockpile. And so when the new bank opens, they start stockpiling reserves. Well, that's taking money out of the money supply. So the money gets tighter. We can't find more money. And that, run, that leads to runs on banks, people running to pull their money out of banks so that the national bank wouldn't stockpile it. People were defaulting on their loans, home loans, business loans. Banks were going bankrupt. Um, as the national bank starts stockpiling money, they didn't have currency in their own vaults. There were no... You could, banks were not loaning money because they didn't have money to loan. Which causes businesses not to be able to borrow money to invest in their own businesses, which causes them to have to lay people off or close altogether, leading to unemployment. So lots of solutions were suggested, including raising tariffs to protect American industry, lowering tariffs to bring in cheap imported goods, um, sponsoring public works projects such as roads and canals to put people back to work, Increasing the money supply, simply printing more money, and or placing restrictions on loans and restricting credits. All of that sounds a lot like what has happened in the last four or five years with the Great Recession of 2008. It's funny how they all follow the same pattern. The election of 1816. So in 1816, um, we're not really having very many Federalists anymore. They're pretty much all gone. And you're left with Democratic Republicans um, running for president. And this is when James Monroe gets elected basically by a landslide. There aren't Federalists anymore. And they sort of die out as a political party. So James Monroe becomes president from 1816 to 1824. Oh, there he is. So let's talk about some of his policies. First, Let's talk about the Seminole War. Down in Florida, you had um, some territorial disputes with Spain at this time. And you also had runaway slaves heading into that Spanish territory and establishing communities and working with local Native Americans. Um, the United States starts sending, under the lead of Andrew Jackson, who was a general at the time, military expeditions into the area. And eventually, um, through negotiations of treaties like the Convention of 1818, which establishes the northern boundary with Canada, disputed over with Great Britain, and the adams onis Treaty of 1819, which basically causes Spain to cede Florida to the United States and establishes the territorial line um, in the far western part of the Louisiana Territory. What's important here with the Seminole Wars is paying attention that this was Spanish territory and those people thought they were being protected by Spain and then it became American territory and Americans started moving into that area and actively pushing the Seminoles Indians out and recapturing those slaves, those former slaves. Um, and it basically the, the Seminole Wars were three skirmishes that occurred between the Native Americans and the African Americans and the American military. And Andrew Jackson was basically forcing the uh, Seminoles to give up their territory. This results in some lawsuits, and we'll talk about those later with the Marshall Court, um, and how the tension between the Native Americans and the federal government really starts at this time. So by 
between 1819 and 1924, really the western boundary of the United States begins to be solidified and people are pushing further and further west. This idea of what is known as manifest destiny, that Americans will occupy the entire continent from sea to shining sea is already beginning to take shape. And Monroe was a big proponent of it. And in fact, you can see here, Americans by 1820 are really pushing into this frontier region and they'll continue just moving west until they reach California by the 1840s. So then in 1820, we have another election between James Monroe and John Quincy Adams, who runs as kind of an independent can candidate. And um, he, uh, he being John Quincy Adams, does not win at that time. He is clearly defeated by the Democratic Republican, and there's no other party running. So we have the breakdown of American political parties right now. We are a one-party system at this point. During Monroe's administration, you get the Talmadge Amendment, this sectionalism, what to do with slaves is still just boiling up and boiling over. So the Talmadge Amendment is introduced to a piece of legislation in the House, and it says all slaves born in Missouri after it becomes a territory would be freed at the age of 25. This passed the House, but not in the Senate, and that is because the North had more people in control of the House, and the South had enough political power to block it in the Senate. So then what do we do? How do states enter? Are they going to be free or are they going to be slaves? So the first compromise we get on this issue is the Compromise of 1820, uh, which has been called a fire bell in the night, basically. And really what happens here is we divide the country, north and south, that northern states that already are free will stay free, states in the south that have slaves will stay slaves, and states, <coughs> excuse me, down here that are potential states will be admitted as slave states into the Union. And that has an impact on the House of Representatives in the makeup, right? They get to count their slaves as three-fifths of a person to bolster their representation. Um, Missouri would be admitted as a slave state and Maine would be admitted as a free state as part of this compromise of 1820. Um, also, the 3630 line basically sort of establishes the boundary between the North and the South. And up here you have the Mason-Dixon line along the Pennsylvania border, which is also a boundary between the North and the South. Monroe takes this idea of manifest destiny and he extends it. Hold on. And he extends it to the rest of the continent. He referred to this as America's self defense doctrine, seeing that European nations were practicing imperialism. Monroe wanted to make sure that he limited European influence in the Americas. So it becomes a foreign policy. Um, of the United States and it gives a warning to European countries that they would not tolerate involvement in the American continents. So it is a, a policy introduced in 1823 and it said that it would view involvement or interference in North or South America as acts of aggression and would require our inv intervention. It's a basically Americans drawing a line in the sand with Europeans who are at this point carving up the world. So here we are taking our stand. And then we will start in a moment with John Quincy Adams. 